Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this video I'm going to be running through a demonstration playthrough of a battle from the uh, Modern Naval Battle series. And what I've done is I've decided to do this a bit half and half, so I wanted to show some elements of the sort of game that a campaign game can produce for you, while at, at the same time not overburdening you with detail and just showing you how a straight-up fight works. So. Those of you who've watched my previous um, video will remember I said that in the basic game all of the ship cards are shuffled together and players are randomly dealt their ships. But what I've done in this case is I have taken a mission from a previous campaign I played, one of the North Atlantic campaign missions, where a small Soviet raiding force uh, accompanied by a submarine is attempting to break out into the Atlantic. I mean really... Um, it's an expensive way of covering the exit of a hunter-killer submarine. The US forces, with a Japanese ally, unusually enough, are there to try and prevent this sort of leakage so that the NATO troop convoys um, heading towards the uh, Norway for the relief of that country are not interfered with. So. These fellows want to sneak out with the minimum amount of damage the United States preferably wants to turn them back. Now, if any of you are wondering why there's a Japanese frigate um, included in the US force, um, that campaign was very, very hard fought, particularly in the Atlantic. And although they generally had the better of it and ended up winning the war, at least in that theater, the NATO forces suffered very heavy losses in light ships and um, they needed to pull in reinforcements from their allies across the globe to try to make up numbers, which is uh, why the poor little Mikumo is out there as, as an advanced scout. You can see why the heavy casualties were, sh were, were suffered. Um, it's always the poor fellows who are out on the perimeter. So your standard setup, whether you're playing a, a basic game from the original set or a mission from the campaign game is your fleet is always organized into three sections. There's an inner core, a middle line and an outer screen and that's either an outer defense or a scouting screen. Um, and these are important because they affect how your ships can be attacked and what by. Um, obviously the outer defense screens are the only ones that can engage each other with gunfire which is why uh, the Soviets have pushed that Grisha class out in the front as basically a speed bump with a limited ability to defend itself and uh, no hard feelings to the poor Mikumo but the only thing she's really good for is to be out on the uh, out on the perimeter doing her thing. Um, the much more capable ships with heavier weapons are echeloned further back particularly the um, the guided missile cruisers of both sides the uh, the Soviets have brought the Slava to the party and uh, and also the Admiral Golovko and the United States have the Virginia and the Vincennes. Um, to really upset the balance, of course, the US also has the fleet carrier Constellation, which is a very formidable unit in its own right. But the Soviets do have a submarine with them and they do have the capacity to cause some mischief. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play through a couple of turns just so you get to see how the basic game works. I have included all the optional combat rules from the basic game, but I won't go into the nitty gritty of the ones from the uh, campaign game. If you would like me to do that, please do say in the comments and I'll do a follow up video where I'll play through a campaign turn from start to finish. But to move on to this, the, the only other thing I have to make you aware of is that I have removed one particular type of action card from the deck. Now, in the basic game, additional ship, essentially they're reinforcement cards. You play it and you draw replacement ship from the deck. In the campaign game, these understandably have to be purchased from a points pool. So in any campaign mission, you'll often find that they're removed from the deck altogether. And I've done that in this case because neither side had any reinforcements available in this mission. 
So the first part of a turn is essentially a um, tidy up phase. So if you had any um, submarines that are active, you would return them to a passive state. Uh, and you would also just decide on looking at your respective hands. This is the Soviet one. What were you going to do in the coming turn? Now, at this stage, it's very difficult to determine because neither side has done their fog of war role yet. So it's really just an initial look at both sides' hands. So the NATO hand is very strong on offensive cards, lots of attacks, including a bomber strike, which is formidable. Not so tough on the defence, where they've just got an evasive manoeuvres. Um, but it can be useful because it stops torpedoes. The Soviets can see they already have a couple of useless cards. None of the ships in their lineup has guns that heavy. But they too have a bomber strike and some damage control ability. They don't have a carrier, so that's another wasted card. But it means the US doesn't have it and they can happily discard it in the, in the knowledge that the, it'll be some time before the US can benefit from that card. So the Soviets are not going to change the status of their submarine at the moment. At this stage, both sides could also move a ship within their formation if they so wish. Now, you can't skip from one... Uh, you can't skip over a line, so you have to move it one space. Let's say Vincennes could move up to the middle line, or the frigate Wadsworth could move to the rear line, that sort of thing. Also, you can never leapfrog a ship over your front row. You're, you're always restricted to having your core, your middle row, and your outer line. So both sides are happy with their starting dispositions. They're not going to make any changes. So it only remains for them to roll for initiative. And NATO has won. So NATO is going to be going first in this one. Normally in a campaign, your initiative would be determined when your mission was determined. But because I'm just playing this one at random, um, and this is pretty much what you would do in a standard game, you just roll off for the initiative. So to start your turn, you roll what's called the Fog of War dice. And this determines how many actions you have for the turn. And the US side has just rolled a three. Each of these costs an action, the red bordered cards. Now the bomber card is a multiple attack card. So for each action point you pay, you can purchase a bomber strike. And these actually, these are what make it so powerful. You can purchase up to four, as you can see the icons on the card. Uh, and it's quite a strong attack. So, the temptation for the US, really, is to just play that bomber strike to get a kick in early. Because the other beauty of an air attack, a bomber strike, is that it can target any units, no matter where they are. So, unlike guns and missiles, which suffer from the limitations of only being able to attack certain positions... The bombers could go straight for the Soviet heavy ships if they wanted to. But while it is tempting to spend three points on a bomber strike, the, um, the US also has to look to its own defence. So they have this one defensive card, evasive manoeuvres. Now they could play it face down for one of these actions as an area defence card, which means that any gun or torpedo attack in the coming turn will be deflected. And that's quite a powerful thing. If they, if they decide not to do that, they can simply keep it in their hand and play it as a point defence reaction whenever an individual ship is attacked. So a good compromise for the US would probably be to put two of their three points into a bomber strike and place that face down. 
I'm going to leave it face up because in an ordinary game, you'd put it face down so that it constitutes a nasty surprise for the Soviet player when they launch their attacks. But we'll just say they don't know. And I'll put it there as a reminder that the US fleet is steering an evasive pattern while they wait for their bomber strike to have some effect. So the bombers are going to go in. They're going to commit their two remaining points to buy two bomber strikes. What are the Soviets going to do about this? Well, they do have options. For starters, the Slava has the air defense ability. So she can try and target one of those incoming strikes by rolling two or less. The air defense ability allows a ship so equipped to cover their entire fleet. So the Russians are going to roll and pray. They get a three, which means the air defense was ineffective. Now, not surprisingly, the heavy bombers are going to try for an early win by attacking the two Soviet heavy ships. And they're going to make their roll against the Slava first. They need a one through three. And they miss. The crew of the Slava breathes a huge sigh of relief as their point defense systems stop the missiles. Never mind. The US will also try for the Admiral Golovko, again needing a one through three. And they roll a six. That was terrible. Okay, not a good start for the United States. Um, they are happy with all the cards they have except for the torpedo because they have no submarines in play. So they're going to discard that card and they will draw back up to seven. Ah, intelligence. Okay, that could be quite useful. More evasive maneuvers. And lastly, a gun attack. Probably, yes, uh, less useful, but never mind. And keep them around. So over to the Soviets. They're somewhat shaken, but they're still in good shape. They have survived a heavy bomber attack from a land-based uh, airfield somewhere. They know that the US fleet has played some kind of defensive card, but they don't yet know what it is. So they're going to start by making their fog of war roll and they get a two. So that's only two actions. That is not all that good. The US has no submarines in play, so that's not much good to them. Neither is that. In fact, actually, we won't look at those cards because it will just cause bewilderment. The Soviets decide, and appropriately enough, it's a picture of one of the big Tupolev backfire bombers, that they're going to return the favour against the US fleet this turn. And they're going to spend both their um, points on a bomber strike. Notice that that's a much more formidable one than the one the US threw at them. They can sink things on a four or less. And they are going to attack the Constellation, and the Vincennes. Now, the US does have defences. The Constellation, the Virginia, and the Vincennes all have anti-aircraft capability. And in addition to that, the US can make a combat air patrol role against, um, against the bombers. Um, or can they? Hang on, let me check that. No, sorry, they can only modify uh, fighter intercept cards. So it is entirely possible that the Soviets will get through. But there's a very formidable close, close range um, capability there. Uh, I may need more dice. I'll be back in a second. Okay, more dice are here because we're going to need them. So the air defences on all three ships are going to target the bomber strike. 
Now, it's just come back to me that the formidable air defence rating of the constellation represents both her cap and the ship's own intrinsic air defence systems. So they need a four or less to shoot down one of the two Soviet bombers. And they get a three, one of them is down. The highly impressive Aegis cruiser Vincennes is going to go next, and that means the split rating. She gets two shots at this, at three or less. She rolls a three and a two, which means that unfortunately for the Soviets, neither of those backfires got anywhere near the US fleet. That was extremely fortunate. So after a somewhat disappointing turn, the Soviets are going to discard those two useless cards, um, along with, because they can't use it, that one. And they'll see what they get back. I should mention at this point that this was a short mission in the campaign game, which means that three battle rounds are played. So we've just seen the first battle round. These games can be quite quick and intense. So it's the beginning of the US player's turn. Their area defense uh, um, card, which was never tested in the end, goes away. They're not going to make any alterations to their formation. So they will roll for their fog of war. And they get a one, oh dear. Someone's suffering a little bit of uh, command indecision here. Um, what are they going to do? It's tempting to mess with the enemy's head, but then there's only two turns, really. Um, they probably want to go on the offensive, but they're also inclined to be cautious. They know there's a submarine out there, so it's very, very tempting to protect the fleet by playing another evasive maneuvers card. In fact, they will. They are also going to... Hmm. Tricky one. This is where it may be worth launching an airstrike just to peel back the layers protecting the Soviet fleet. So for their last action, the Constellation will launch an airstrike and the target... The target will be the Grisha because she's going to be an easy mark, hopefully. So the Constellation launches its airstrike the Soviets have the Slava. She's going to attempt to stop it. She rolls a six. The US aircraft get through. Have the Soviets got anything that they can know? They have the damage control card, which the US does not know about. But the tough question for them is, do they spend that precious card which can negate the, 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 the effects of one attack? It's a powerful card. Do they spend it on a cheap little frigate, but at least maintain their outer defence? Or do they just take it, knowing that if they lose the Grisha, they're either going to have to reallocate some ships from the middle line, or their heavy ships have become vulnerable to attack? It's going to be a difficult choice, but let's see whether the US air attack succeeds. There's two points worth of airstrike, which is two or less to sink a ship outright. But because the Grisha's in the vulnerable first row, it's bumped up to three or less. So the US pilots are boring in and the Soviets are holding their breath. The US rolls a five. The attack is ineffective. Looks like the Soviet fleet's standoff systems managed to uh, keep them going after all. So that is the end of the second US turn. And given how little they achieved, there's much muttering about this. Over to the Soviets. They don't have to stay in this ring for very long before their sub can make its getaway and they can they can retreat to the uh, the the safety of I suppose it would be Murmansk really. 
So what are they going to do? Their fog of war roll is a five, which is an immense advantage. They're going to be throwing a lot of attacks in with this. Well, they're certainly going to be using that torpedo. Remember, they don't know what the US has played. So they declare that for their first of five actions, the Alpha class is going to make its presence known and launch a torpedo at the constellation. And then various other ships are going to conduct missile attacks. In fact, the Soviets have excess um, uh, excess um, cap uh, intelligence capability. They, they've got a limited number of orders they can carry out because of the way their ships are arranged. So let's just say the Kronstadt and the Admiral Oktyabrsky are going to launch concentrated missile strikes. One on the Mikumo, the other on the USS Gray. And the torpedo is heading for the carrier. That's pretty much all they can do with the hand they've got this turn. At this point, the US reveals that their fleet is undergoing evasive maneuvers so the Alpha class's attack is automatically negated. Unfortunately, evasive maneuvers don't do anything against the missiles. And the only response card they have is all it does is allow them to negate a special blue card rather than an attack card. So they've managed to get the constellation away from the torpedo attack, but they can do nothing about the anti-ship missiles which are boring in. So... The Kronstadt hits the Mikumo, and the missile card does two damage. Well, the poor little Mikumo only has the capability to absorb two damage, so she is sunk outright. USS Grey is made of slightly sterner stuff, but not by much. So the missiles from the Admiral Oktyabrsky slam into her. And while she's a well-built Oliver Hazard Perry class... Um, she gets the minus two card added as a reminder. So she's in pretty, pretty ropey conditions. And it's an optional rule in the game that if your ship is reduced to a single hull point, you lose your fighting capacity, which makes sense. She's been very badly battered. So that was a good round for the Soviets. They're going to hang on to these various weapons cards just in case the situation goes horribly wrong. And they will draw... Oh, no. <laughs> Not another of those. They will draw these cards to get them up to... up to seven. And that is the end of turn two. A um, fairly dramatic reversal with the Soviets now holding something an advan of an advantage and the US having to lick their wounds a bit. So now we get to the beginning of turn three. The only good thing for the US is the Alpha class has now revealed its position. So they may get a shot, an opportunity for some vengeance. We'll have to see. So they've got a fair mix of things they can do. Oh no, they've only made a, a roll of one for Fog of War. Okay, <laughs> for the final turn of the game, the US can only perform one action. Oh dear. Well, there's all these various attacks they can make, but and but none of them are anti-submarine, unfortunately, so it looks like the Alpha is going to escape. However, they can use their air attack in a desperate throw of the dice to try and equal the score, because the Soviets have um, two victory points definitely in the bag, and they're perilously close to having another three. The US is going to throw an airstrike at the Slav which is a very bold move. So the Slava, again, is going to be the fleet's air defence ship, and she has a particular interest in rolling well. She's not done it terribly well so far. She rolls a one, stopping the US airstrike. That is most unfortunate for the US player. 
um, in which case they are going to discard their entire hand because there's going to be no more rainy days, it's the last turn of the game, and draw fresh cards in the hope that they will get some defensive cards for whatever retribution the Soviets might throw at them. And it's not a brilliant mix. Although there's another evasive maneuvers card, that may help. So over to the Soviet turn. They're still happy with their dispositions. Um, they're not going to bother having the Alpha class go passive again because they want to use that beautiful torpedo card. So they will just... And they're, they're happy with their fleet formation. They're going to keep it. It's served them well so far. Now, they too have been very unlucky. They've just rolled a one for their Fog of War. So they only have a single action that they can perform. Um, they are similarly... Hmm. Now, in the context of the game, hitting the constellation with that would not sink it. But in the context of, the, of a campaign and multiple missions, slamming a torpedo into the constellation would almost guarantee, unless NATO were desperate, that she would be out of action and under repair next turn. So the Soviet captain on the submarine decides he's going to end with style before he zooms out into the vastness of the North Atlantic. And he chucks another torpedo at the constellation. Unluckily for him, the US exercises its ability to play that as a point defence card, which is free. It doesn't cost anything. So the torpedo attack is made, but unfortunately the US and NATO countermeasures are just that little bit too good, and the attack is evaded. The Soviet player probably is cursing volubly by now, but actually they have not done badly. This mission ends at that point. The assumption is that the submarine has successfully broken out. The surface units can probably safely return now that their um, role in this is over. Indeed, given the lack of uh, a carrier and reliable air support, it's probably a good idea for the Soviets to pull back. They have scored slightly over NATO in terms of victory points. They've performed their strategic mission. And they can afford to withdraw now. For the, for the US and NATO, it's not been so great. They've lost one frigate, yet another heavy loss among their lighter craft. And the USS Grey is in such a bad state that she is going to have to spend the next couple of turns waiting for repair and refit. Indeed, it's probably a miracle she gets back at all, given the state she's in. So that is it. Um, that, that is the end of this particular battle. Uh, in a campaign, you can fight as many as um, six, seven, eight battles if you wish to. You can either predetermine the number of battles or there's a mechanism for neither player knowing when the war will end. Um, the campaign may well end depending on how well one side performs. A series of quick victories may bring it to a close uh, fairly rapidly or it may end up being a bit of a bloody slog. So there's a lot of variability in the campaigns and you can see you've got this wonderful mesh of a system that allows you to play fairly quick one-off battles but at the same time bolting them into a somewhat larger system. So that was a short battle. If the mission brief and the mission profile had been different, if we'd gone for a protracted long-range naval engagement where the object was to destroy the enemy's fleet rather than do something snazzy like cover the escape of a submarine, um, then you could have up to six turns, depending. But there are also rules for bad weather and other forms of interference which can end a battle sooner than you would have hoped. So I hope that's given you a, a very... Um, brief but I hope uh, informative uh, overview of how a battle works in modern naval battles um, with some elements of the campaign and the optional rules thrown in. 
Um, if you do have any questions or if there's anything I've, uh, you think I might have missed, please do address them in the comments and I will get back to you as soon as I can. As I said earlier, if you would like to see a full campaign game played through or perhaps a single turn from a campaign game, then please do uh, let me know. I will put something together and have a, have a bit of a think and do some planning. Um, but uh, yes, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed making it. As always, it's really awesome to see you guys. Thank you very much for tuning into the channel and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye.